You're watching Eye on Africa here on France 24. I'm Julia Kim. These are the headlines on the continent. Tributes pour in for Ghana's former president, Jerry Rawlings. He led two military coups before becoming the country's democratically elected president. Amnesty International confirms what it calls the massacre of likely hundreds of civilians in Ethiopia's Tigray region. The report comes as Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed announced major advances in the West. And from 50,000 people a day to just 500. Activity at what was once one of Africa's busiest borders has been reduced to a trickle as COVID-19 restrictions hit a vital trade artery between DR Congo and Rwanda. But first, tributes are pouring in from across the continent after the passing of Ghana's former president, Jerry Rawlings. He died at the age of 73 in a hospital in Accra, where he'd been receiving treatment after a short illness. A week of national mourning has been announced for the country's longest serving leader. After leading two military coups, Rawlings oversaw the transition to multi-party elections in what is now one of Africa's most stable democracies. Laurent Bershtecker reports. Born in 1947 to a Ghanaian mother and a Scottish father, Jerry Rawlings showed from an early age the strength and convictions of a man destined for greatness. After completing his military training in the Air Force, Rawlings staged his first coup in 1979 and became the head of the country at only 32 years old. He quickly passed the reins to an elected president, Hila Lehman, but two years later, he took up arms again against a government he perceived as corrupt and incompetent, and this time seized power for good. Over the next decade, Rawlings ruled over Ghana with an iron fist, abolishing political parties, executing opponents, and suspending the constitution. He also abandoned his socialist ideals as he implemented neoliberal policies in line with the IMF to help revive a struggling economy. In the early 90s, Rawlings heeded growing calls for multi-party democracy and organized Ghana's first elections in over a decade. A popular and charismatic figure, he was elected president in 1992 and again four years later. Unable to run for a third term, he stepped down in 2000 after the defeat of his designated successor. Following his passing at the age of 73, Ghana declared seven days of national mourning to pay tribute to a man still widely considered a national icon and a precursor of African self-determination. Well, turning now to Ethiopia, an Amnesty International has given the first report on large-scale civilian fatalities in the conflict between the Tigray People's Liberation Front and the government of Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed. The report describes how hundreds of people were stabbed or hacked to death in Tigray on Monday. Meanwhile, Nobel laureate Abiy announced federal forces had made major gains in the region's west. We are confident that in a relatively short period of time, we will accomplish our objectives and create a conducive environment for life to return to normalcy for our citizens in Tigray. We will exercise due care to protect law-abiding and peaceful citizens from being harmed by oppression we are undertaking. Well, since launching an off offensive there last Wednesday, thousands of Ethiopian refugees have reportedly been streaming over the border into Sudan. But as our correspondent in Addis Ababa tells us, with communications down and the media barred, information is difficult to verify. It's been very difficult to verify uh, any type of information. Uh, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed is uh, saying that the federal troops are now controlling uh, the northwestern part of the Tigray region, and this includes the city of Humera, uh, close to the border with uh, Sudan and Eritrea. But it's very likely that fighting is still ongoing in other parts uh, of the region. Uh, information has been essentially channeled uh, through uh, the government, state media, and uh, Tigrayan uh, television. There is now even a fact-checking 
account uh, set up by the government uh, for this uh, conflict. So there's been kind of an information battle between the government and the Tigrayan authorities. For example, it's uh, still unclear whether Eritrea uh, has now entered uh, the conflict. The government is saying that federal troops had to retreat past uh, the Eritrean border. But uh, Tigrayan authorities are saying uh, that uh, Eritrean troops entered the region to attack uh, Tigrayan uh, forces. And this information would be very important because it, it could tell us a lot about you know, the current dynamics and the dimension of the conflict, but it's been very uh, difficult to report on this so far. Eight peacekeepers have been killed after their helicopter crashed in Egypt's Sinai Peninsula. Six Americans, one French and one Czech national were all military service members, according to a statement from the US-led multinational force and observers. The sole survivor of the crash was an American who's been taken to a hospital in Israel. The MFO said the helicopter was on a routine mission near the resort town of Sharm el-Sheikh before it went down. So far, the crash is being treated as an accident. Now, the continent's most advanced economy is being battered by the pandemic. According to official figures, nearly a third of South Africa's workforce was unemployed between July to September. It's the highest jobless rate in 12 years. An additional 2.2 million people registered as unemployed in Q3, with young people the worst hit. Now, since imposing a strict lockdown in March, South Africa has been plunged deeper and deeper into recession. Its economy is expected to shrink by more than 7% this year, its biggest contraction in almost 90 years. Now, the frontier, known as the Small Barrier, used to be one of Africa's busiest borders. A vital artery for trade, it connects the DR Congo's Goma and Rwanda's Gisenyi. But in March, cross-border activity ground to a halt due to the pandemic. Earlier this month, the Small Barrier reopened, but only to those who can show a negative COVID-19 test result. Simon Wolfharter tells us more. When the Small Barrier was closed eight months ago, Fidaste lost his livelihood overnight. He is part of a cooperative of disabled drivers which transports goods to Congo six times a day. I had to use all my savings in the past seven months. Finally, today my life can resume and I can make money again with the opening of the border. People crossing the border have to show a negative COVID-19 test result that is no older than two weeks. Each cooperative can get one free test for one trader to cross over. Most other people cannot afford it, and so the crossing has remained deserted. People at the Kisenya market are critical of this system. The women here lack the means. To be able to return to Congo, we asked for a lot of money. $50 for a COVID test is huge, and we don't earn enough for that. So for us, nothing has changed. It's as if the borders were still closed. These new rules were jointly decided by Rwandan and Congolese authorities. This is not the first time. During the last Ebola outbreak in 2018, the two countries also had to work together. We handled the Ebola virus together. I think we handled it very well. For any pandemic that arises, there is no other way but to fight it together. Before the COVID pandemic, 50,000 people passed the border daily, compared to only 500 today. Now, a campaign to save a 100-year-old fig tree in Nairobi has borne fruit, with Kenya's president announcing a decree to save it. Described as a beacon of the country's cultural and ecological heritage, the tree had been slated to be uprooted to make way for a Chinese-funded highway. Instead, the road will be rerouted and its leafy canopy will sprawl over the capital for hopefully another century. They call it the fig tree. In Kenya's capital, it needs no introduction. Four stories high and almost a century old, it's one of Nairobi's most iconic monuments. Much to the delight of locals, the beloved fig tree will live to see another day. On behalf of His Excellency the President, NMS will issue a declaration of conservation for this tree, for this iconic tree. This will be the first of many to follow. 
Standing in the path of a mega highway, the tree's days had been numbered. Engineers were getting ready to uproot it and transplant it in order to make way for a Chinese-funded expressway west of Nairobi. Kenyan officials defended the project as necessary to unclog the city's traffic jams. For its opponents, the fig tree quickly became a symbol of the country's growing reliance on Chinese investment and environmental degradation. Known as a green city in the sun, a number of trees have been cut down in recent years to make way for construction sites. It took a presidential decree to end the standoff. On Wednesday, Kenyan President Uru Kenyatta issued a decree to save the beloved fig tree, a victory for activists. This decision today gives me hope that activism works when it comes to protecting our environment and our green spaces. The tree, which is considered sacred among the Kikuyu ethnic group, will be adopted by the city. While Kenyan authorities and the Chinese construction company have agreed to reroute the road. And finally, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie's novel Half of a Yellow Sun has been voted the best book to have won the Women's Prize for Fiction in its 25-year history. The Nigerian-born author, who won in 2007, was chosen in a public vote from a list of all 25 winners. Other past winners include Zadie Smith and the late Andrea Levy. Now, the one-off award marks the anniversary of the prize, formerly known as the Orange Prize. The book is set in Nigeria during the Biafran War and explores the end of colonialism, ethnic allegiances, class, race and, of course, female empowerment. And that's it from us. More news coming up. Stay tuned.